We got to get up there. We just got to get up there and do a Brent tech tear makeover. Out, te- tear out the networking. I keep inviting you. I keep sending photos of the view. I, I don't know. How I know. And now I here. really am. I'm trying to get you down here for the diesel heater. So mm, right. we'll swap. I'm, con- I'm so confused. So I'll go there. You come here. We'll do a house swap. Yeah. It'll be good. Yep. All right. <clears throat> There's literally moose steak in my freezer waiting on it. It's got your name on it. What? And There's moose steak? What? Do you marinate moose steak? I mean, you could do all sorts of things. Do you? I mean, do you kind of <laughs> need to marinate moose steak? No, no, no. You, no, no. you do not need to. Yeah, is it because it's really meaty or no, 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 no? Yeah, you could sous vide the stuff. Come on, moose up. Yeah, yeah. I guess I need to go get a little moose and find out. Hello, friends, and welcome back to your weekly Linux talk show. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. And my name is Brentley. Well, hello, gentlemen. Coming up this week, Fedora 41 is here. We're going to break down some of the best new features, and then we'll branch out for a three-way spin showdown. Then we'll round it out with some great boosts, a blowout pick segment, and a lot more. So before we get any further, we need to say hello to our virtual lug who's joining us live in Mumble. Hello and time-appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Hello. 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 Thank you guys for being here. Good little group on air and a nice little group in the quiet listening to getting the feed right off the mixer. Yeah, you hear us. We see you. And a big thank you to our friends at Tailscale. Go say good morning and support the show and get Tailscale for free up to 100 devices and three user accounts. Tailscale.com slash unplugged. That's not a limited time deal either. That's the plan I've been on now for over a year. You can build a simple, flat, Mesh network across complex infrastructure protected by... Oh, I go. There it is. That's right. And it's so, so fast. It's simple for end users, and it's powerful for administrators. And you can connect multiple providers or devices all together in one secure network, which you can set ACLs over. You can authenticate devices. It can use your existing authentication infrastructure. It's... It's really great, and it's super fast to get set up and packaged for just about every distro out there. So go say good morning and support it for support the show and get it for free on 100 devices and try it out. It is the best VPN solution out there I've used, and I have no inbound ports on my firewalls anymore. Check it out at tailscale.com slash unplugged, and thank you to them. I wanted to let you know that there is a local event just in our neck of the woods coming up on Friday, November 8th. It is Siegel 2024. It'll run uh, Friday and Saturday, and I don't think it's on Sunday, right? It's just the two days? I believe so. Yeah. What do you think, Wes? Looks like it's a good one. They got four keynotes. Yeah. Uh, there's a Postgres talk I'm hoping to make already because mm. it's all about temporal data, which is neat. I was wondering if you're thinking about going to that. Yeah, it's been, I think I missed the last one, yeah. but I'm, I'm glad that, you know, especially as Linux Fest is, you know, trying to regain its second life. I think it's important to have another good, you know, local Pacific Northwest conference. we got a lot of tech and Linux folks here. We might as well get up and, you know, yep. talk about it. It's a good excuse to take a ride into the city and uh, enjoy some Linuxy stuff, too. Yeah, I think it's at the University of Washington this year, which will be different. Oh, really? At least for me, yeah. You know, in previous years, too, they've had some child care available as well. I mean, they, they try to make it as accessible to people as possible. Uh, so it all kicks off on Friday, November 8th. So it's coming up really quick as this episode goes out. And then... A little bit further down the road, I'm happy to announce that NixCon is back, but it's back with a new name. It's now called Planet Nix, and it'll be taking place alongside scale again, March 6th through the 7th, 2025, in Pasadena, California. And I guess there's a separate uh, CFP for Planet Nix, separate from the scale one, which just closed. Um, this one has a submission deadline of December 9th. So if you're, um, you know, want to try to get in there, get on it. Ooh. You going to give a talk, Wes? <laughs> I don't know what we'd give a talk on. Um, you could give a, you just give it a pass. We got to, we got to make some more Nicks in the studio, maybe. Yeah. Sounds like if anyone has any suggestions for what uh, we should talk about, please send them in. <laughs> there you go. Well, Fedora 41 has arrived and it's right on time. And like every cycle, there's always something new in here to talk about. They're always moving things forward a little bit. Uh, At the top of the list for the standard workstation spin, obviously, is GNOME 47. 
right out of the box. That's what you're going to notice. There's visual refreshes throughout GNOME. You got the accent colors in there and the new dialogue windows in there. I guess enhanced support for small screens too. That could be nice. It could be. The uh, GNOME 47 experience is top notch. And we kind of talked about that in Ubuntu 2410 review as well. And then Wes, did you say they've also got uh, some new terminal love? Yeah, I don't know how you say it exactly. Maybe Patexas? But uh, it's a container, I guess, container-savvy terminal that uh, plays especially nicely with things like DistroBox or Toolbox. We have talked about this, I think, as a pick once before on the show. Yeah, and it's also um, has been in use over in the Ublue land. Yes, that's, I think, the episode we talked about it. Um, so this is this is a container-savvy Container first terminal. So like, essentially, I think in plain language, that just means each tab could be its own contained environment. It is kind of, I wonder how long this will last. We've, you know, we had, we've already had some uh, terminal change over in the, the GNOME ecosystem. Um, but from what we've played with, I like it as a terminal. Yeah. It is nice. It's probably got more features than the new GNOME terminal that we just switched to recently. It is strange that we're, Fedora doesn't usually deviate too from upstream like this. I think there's some undercurrents of just overall um, Ublu influence in this release, and I wonder, you know, this might be one of those sites. Mm. Wayland is the default everywhere now. Say it ain't so. Yep, 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 yep. I don't even think X11 gets installed. I mean, I'm sure X Wayland does. And I yeah, think I think if you install X if you want yes. it on the command line. Or you need to upgrade from 40. And I think if you upgrade from 40 to 41, I think yeah. you keep X, which is what I did. But I never had X on my system anyways. <laughs> I'll get to that later. Um, I don't know what else jumped at. I, oh, probably DNF five, right? Yeah, that is a big one. Yeah, and I think to me it does feel a little faster. I do think some of the output looks a little bit better. They say it streamlines, you know, uh, its operation, and uh, I mean DNF has never been particularly slow for me, but I, it is nice to see them continue chip away. And I know people that use Fedora very regularly, very psych- psyched to see DNF five land. Yeah, I think it's um, you know. It's been in the works for a long time, yeah. and it's kind of like a piece that even if you're not necessarily excited about, like, what's the shiny outside-of-the-box feature for DNF 5, I think it lays plumbing for a lot of stuff to come in future improvements that we'll see in, like, 42, 43, et cetera. Yeah, sort of the kind of the same thing with the bootable container stuff. You know, Fedora 41 lays the groundwork for some bootable containers. Yes, a bootable container. <laughs> and DNF 5 plays a role in that as well. Um, but it's not really fully there yet, right? 42 is kind of when you're going to see all of that supposedly land. Same with, like, the new installer. Anaconda is still the installer for Fedora 41, and I believe 42 is the target now for the new installer. And so, you know, I I honestly was uh, a little nostalgic as I installed Fedora 41 in a VM because I also did did my VM install again, and I also did – I upgraded a system. I'll get into that. I was like, this might be the last time I really use Anaconda. And so I kind of enjoyed it because it's at a really good spot, especially if you're just kind of going with all the defaults and you know where to click done and all those things, you know, because some of the buttons are in different places than you might expect. And when you're used to all of that, it's a, it's been a really great installer. And I I hope and imagine that when I install Fedora 42, I'll be using something entirely new. Well, I think some there's some exciting stuff happening with the spins this time around. We have a new Miracle spin, which I'll get into a little bit later, but that spin is running the Miracle Window Manager, which gets its debut this time around. I I heard friend of the show, Neil, had something to do with that one. I'm sure we'll hear all about it at some point. That said, KDE Plasma spin, Fedora Kinoite, gets the 6.2 of Plasma, which I think is nice and modern. Yeah, 6.2 is great. It's a great Plasma. Um, I also just thought that, uh, because I tried Kinoite and I'll touch on that later, but and I'm already running 6.2 on my current ThinkPad NixOS desktop, but just out of the box, some about, and I don't even like, this is petty, but I don't even like the default desktop wallpaper this time. Sometimes I do with these oh, really? races, but it's not I my actually, favorite. I actually did like it this time. But there's something about the Plasma 6.2 dock yeah, with the Fedora logo yeah. and the little bit of blue. It just A little really, bit of pass-through color. Yeah, really pops. Yeah, it does look good. I agree. So this Fedora feels like it's really setting up for like a big 42. Like there's a lot of nice things in here. Like here's an example. And this is probably where I have the most FOMO with this release. We are seeing serious progress on NVIDIA drivers. Now, you can have the proprietary NVIDIA driver and use Secure Boot. And you can set it up through GNOME software. Yeah. That's like 
<laughs> on Fedora. On Fedora, right. Thank you. Like, that's the thing. That's what you used to go get other distributions to do. Right. And uh, so they're continuing to push that forward. And I'm just, I'm feeling FOMO because I, while I don't think it's there yet, I can see within a release or two of, you know, so another year at most, we're going to have a really smooth Wayland secure boot NVIDIA experience. It's like it's it's almost there. It's not there quite yet, but it's there where like the leading edge distributions are starting to push for it. And we saw this with Ubuntu as well. And so, because you know, as I have been in the back of my mind, you guys know, and I've talked about just a little bit on the show, I, for, you know, a few months now, I've kind of been looking at pricing a, a new rebuild of my PC. And every time I get to like all of the specs and I look at the GPU prices, I just, it's way, it's just, it's ridiculous. And if I want anything that can do AI, it's like I'm kind of stuck in the NVIDIA world for right now. So maybe in a year, Linux users won't be in this weird situation where they have to decide between a well-behaving, performant, stable desktop or something that can do CUDA and other AI workloads. Maybe you could have best of both worlds with whichever graphics card you go with, and even if that's an NVIDIA. But you see the beginnings here with the integration with Secure Boot now. It's getting closer to just you don't have to have this funky one-off setup when you use an NVIDIA card. Now, we do have a question for you, the audience, uh, with our recent, well, this episode's Fedora 41 overview and also our recent coverage of Ubuntu 2410 out. Uh, We're curious, are you switching to these new releases? You know, we do, and we do all sorts of crazy things on them, but we're curious if you're switching to them uh, on your machines. And for those who aren't switching, do you find value in the coverage of these releases, the way we're doing them? Uh, Boost in or write in and let us know. This spot right here, this could be yours. If you have a product, a business, a service, and you'd like to feature it on Linux Unplugged, email me, chris at jupiterbroadcasting.com. I'd love to talk to you. I think it'd be great to have somebody out there in the community that sponsors this show. I'll make a great deal, too, since it has been the ad winter for a little bit. But if you don't have a product, if you don't have something to sell, you can still support the show. The new annual membership supports all the shows on the network. I'll have a link in the show notes. You get access to all the shows for every podcast, their special features, and their ad-free feeds. And you get one month for free with the annual membership. Of course, you can just support this show directly at linuxunplugged.com slash membership. You get the ad-free feed, which is all tidied up by Drew. Or you get the bootleg, which is everything. And we pack a ton of extra content into that. Extra news stories and discussions. Stuff that's just for our members. You get access to it either way with the annual membership, a party, yeah, with the Jupiter party, or when you go to linuxunplugged.com slash membership. You can also boost, of course. Any messages above 2,000 sats, we try to get those on the air and read them. That goes to each one of us, including Editor Drew. And it's a way to support us directly on your terms, on your schedule, at the amount you like. You know, for those of you who like to set their own terms. The membership's available for the autopilot system, and you just set it and forget it. And the boosts are those who are a little more active, who like to kind of, instead of do the ongoing thing, support at the value they feel it is worth at the time. That's the whole idea with value for value. I won't take any more of your time. If you enjoyed this episode, you got some value from the podcast, please consider participating in one way or another. And now, back to the show. Well, this time around, I got quite distracted with the spins that are available again. I don't know. It's spin season here for Brent. And the Fedora Miracle spin caught my eye since it's kind of new and fresh for Fedora and the Fedora family, if you will. Now, if you are not familiar with Miracle, it's a tiling uh, Wayland first window manager built on top of Mir. Mir being that modern C++ library for writing Wayland compositors uh, that Canonical has been working on for a while now. Uh, Miracle itself, written by primarily by Matthew Kozarek, who works at Canonical and on Mir full-time with the team there. So someone who knows what they're doing. The project does disclose some goals, which I thought was good to get into. Uh, they want to be a tiling window manager at its core, very much in the style of i3 or Sway, for those who are familiar, with the intention to be a compositor that is flashier and more feature-rich than either of those compositors, sort of like Sway FX. Another goal is to be compatible with i3 from an IPC perspective, in the same way that Sway is. There's a bit of compatibility between the different Windows 
tiling managers, which is nice to see, and to create a flashy, cozy tiling window manager that absolutely anyone can use, similar to Hyperland, but with less focus on expert users. And lastly, to be a flagship example of full-featured window manager built on top of Mir. So a lot Mir. of a lot of Mir, interesting of goals things. there. Yeah, I know, yeah right? fascinating. It's and it's really neat to see this outside the Ubuntu ecosystem as well, right? For people that don't recall, there, uh, Mir was created as an alternative to Wayland by Canonical for a period of time when it wasn't clear if Wayland was going to get across the finish line. When it became obvious that Wayland was getting across the finish line, perhaps because in part of competition from Mir. Canonical pivoted to making Mir a Wayland client. And so we have seen this in certain areas inside the Ubuntu ecosystem, but this is a Fedora spin. It's probably worth pointing out too, you know, the, um, Canonical gets a lot of flack for, you know, not invented here syndrome, but uh, here's a case where they, yeah, they, they explored their own way, but they ultimately switched, switched to the consensus. Yeah, there's a really great talk given by Matthew at Flock 2024, where he kind of describes how, yes, he works full-time at Canonical on Mir, but this is a side project, a personal side project, which means he could use what he's an expert at, but also make it applicable a little bit more widely than just at Canonical, which is nice to see. You know, uh, as a dev, that that sounds really nice. You kind of get to push forward on the core parts and then use the functionality you're implementing at your day job in personal projects. Awesome. Well, and if it does meet its goal of being a flagship example of a fully featured window manager on top of Mir, then I think everybody wins, right? Brings more attention to all the projects. I'm excited you looked at this, and I'm kind of curious to know how it went, what your observations were. Yeah, so my very first observation is right on the GitHub page, it says, this is still experimental, please, you know, know this in advance, but also please send in, you know, bug reports and that kind of thing. So it's early days for the project, and yet is an official spin a Fedora, which I think is a really interesting balance. And I wanted to know your feelings on it. So currently it's it's a 0.3.7. And they say the goal is for the 1.0 in about December to be feature complete. Uh, they do have wow. a really nice roadmap as well where they define, you know, stage one, we're going to do this and stage, you know. Uh, so they're, I guess, just completed stage three being the 0 0.3 with stage four, a bunch of things happening. Um, but they seem a little behind on that timeline. So, I, I, you know, December's written. I don't think that's going to happen. But it got me really curious because, you know, Fedora has a bunch of spins. Uh, some of them more, far more mature than uh, the Miracle, but it's really interesting to me to see a project like this be accepted as an official spin so early in its development cycle. And at first I was kind of worried about that. I was like, wait, 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 this isn't polished at all. What's going on here? But really it's getting a bunch of new eyes on the project. It's getting the project to I don't know, fit into the ecosystem early on in its life. And I think actually it might be a good thing. Yeah. It's it's either telling that the process to become a spin has become more streamlined, and so it's it's more straightforward to do that. And there are a lot of spins now. It's getting a little bit much to keep track of. Or it could be that people involved with the project see a potential and a, maybe a particular use case for this. I mean, this is a this is an interesting beast, right? Using Mir like this to kind of handle some of the Wayland stuff is fascinating, and to call it the miracle spin kind of calls back to the beefy miracle, but also plays with Mir. Mm. I, I, I'm really loving the name. I think they nailed that. Tiling window managers are very popular right now. And so to have something that is a little more approachable and ready to go out of the box seems like a pretty good product positioning. Um, So, like, I don't know if it's for me, and I, I don't know how useful you found it, but... I'm. I know you could argue they have too many spins already, but I'm kind of happy to see it, and I'm glad it's not like a multi-year process, and that they can kind of get under that umbrella from the near beginning. Yeah, I mean, we hear from our audience all the time. You know, you guys got to try a tiling window manager. Just give it like a month or three, right? And uh, and you'll eventually be cozy in it. And so I've always been interested in like a purely tiling environment because in Plasma, I'm using the tiling functionality all the time, but, you know, I'm mousing around and stuff like that. And But what I found kind of nice in Miracle is that right now all the keyboard bindings are there to move windows around in a tiling manager, as you would expect. 
But like I mentioned in this in this fourth stage, they're working specifically on using the mouse to kind of open up the user landscape, let's say. So for someone who's just coming into a tiling window manager, using the mouse to do things is a little bit nicer to you know learn the ways. So I thought that was really nice for a project like this. I mean, they're not the only ones doing it, but it is essential to onboard new users. So Chris, I wonder if you tried something like this, if it was like a smoother onboarding and you didn't have to dive into the configuration files to get what you wanted. Yeah, absolutely. I've been sort of waiting for a Fedora Hyperland spin, but I'd be totally happy to give Miracle a spin. Um, when you're using it, Brent, like the file manager and that stuff, are these GTK applications? Are they Qt applications? Like what, what uh, taking the tiling aside, what are your day-to-day applications? Yeah, I saw mostly GTK-based apps. So, you know, Tuner is is a file manager you know and love, <laughs> or hopefully you love, hopefully you know. Oh, so it's using Thunar? Thunar, is that? You said it called I said Thunar? Tuner, Thunar. but maybe I got it wrong. I mean, who knows? Really? I call it Thunar because it looks like Tor, right? It's like, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> Things you read but never say out loud. There were familiar applications that even if I haven't used them you know, recently, I was like, oh, yeah, I know that's the file manager and stuff. So yeah. as far as I understand, uh, it uses the NWG shell, which is the GTK3-based UI for Sway and Hyperland uh, that they're using. So it feels very kind of Gnome Unity-esque and being, you know, having GTK3. So I thought it was um, familiar enough in that respect. But of course, me being sort of new to tiling, uh, different enough for me to really have to slow down. (laughs) (laughs) But that's a, you know, there's a learning curve for, for about anything. So I found it surprisingly smooth and snappy kudos on them there are of course bugs you know there's a bug that uh says my computer battery was at zero percent it just so happened that the computer i was using didn't have a battery so there's that but uh you know it's a small detail i guess that's technically true then well (laughs) zero 100 it's all the same for that case it just didn't need a massive notification that was all red (laughs) but so if you can get around like for now if you can get around those like small uh, let's call them inconsistencies, then I thought it was a cool experience to dive into. I think what the warning that exists on the GitHub page is probably pretty accurate that, yeah, it's early days, but they're moving forward. So expect a f- couple bugs, but it's cool to dive in and, and tr- to try it and see where, it, where it's headed, basically. Well, what do you think about checking in like uh, in a year from now or so, or maybe in even six months? Yeah, with that roadmap suggesting December for a 1.0, but then me sort of just mapping... Where I think they're at, I think six months is pretty accurate. You know, yeah. Give it six months and they'll be in a place that is nice and mature. And I wonder if being an official spin now will uh, bring some extra eyes, some extra development uh, you know, time. So I think your eyes. six months. Put yeah, it on the calendar. Okay. Well, there you go. The miracle spin. Uh, as uh, Brantley says, looking pretty good. Got some room. Right as it says on the tin. Now, Mr. Wes Payne. You went a little different direction. You went with a tried and true Kenonite, which is, I believe, uh, if I recall, they're kind of like their silver blue, but for the Plasma desktop. Uh, Yeah, that's right. So I also got KDE Plasma 6.2. Ah, yeah. uh, Looking really nice. I did run into like my default download from the mirror was going real slow, but I poked around the... What, like only 30 megabytes a second or No, it was real slow, Uh, like one or two megs. Oh, that's so bad. Yeah. <laughs> this was more just to say, uh, Fedora has a lot of, is mirrored widely. Yeah. And uh, I was able to find several options that were way faster. Oh, yeah. Well, because I wanted to try uh, Kino White and Silver Blue uh-huh. and a couple of, you know, so I wanted, I was getting multiple ISOs here. Wes got fiber, everybody. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to them all. <laughs> uh, we'll be like, we'll be there too. Don't feel bad. When I get fiber, I'm going to do the same thing. So just wait one day. Now, the part I couldn't speed up, uh, unfortunately, is the. Um, Atomic Installer is still pretty slow. I think we remember this when we were playing with the Ublue stuff. You don't get a ton of feedback. Uh, you know, it starts off very just regular Anaconda E, and then it does the actual, you know, different setup for the uh, Atomic style. But it works totally fine. I will say, um, I did uh, the little trick we talked about recently where I set things up using a virtual machine and then k uh into Kino White. And man, they are just, I assume this is true for all the Fedora 41 setups. They're just really set up to virtualize very nicely. I'm using QEMU in the Virgil, uh, Vert, you know, Vert IO basically for everything, uh, including the graphics and just no issues, nothing to load, nothing to fuss with, just 
worked. Screen well. just worked. Super snappy. Yeah, I mean, like using the plasma. I'm running plasma on the host, and there's plasma in there, and using either one was basically the same. I used, uh, for one of my installs, I also did the QMU install to the raw disk thing, just like I did for Ubuntu. So I, I do the initial installation inside a VM, and then I K-exec and boot into the physical hardware. And same thing, I was, for this test, I was doing workstation, and I could resize the QMU window, and the resolution would automatically yeah. resnap inside the VM. It just worked. Everything worked out of the box. Like my mouse could move in and out, no problem. That was nice. Now, okay, uh, if you don't recall the Fedora Atomic stuff, like Silver Blue and Kino White, uh, they use RPM OS tree under the hood. Uh, so o- OS tree is the part that handles trees, file system trees, like root file system trees, um, and provides the atomic bits, right? So let you think of these not as individual packages, but like a single monolithic tree that you can swap to. You go from one whole system to another whole system, and that's where you get the, the rollback functionality and you know the a- atomic guarantees. Uh, and then there's RPM OS tree, which leverages OS tree sort of for like the base stuff and providing those atomic parts. But then it bridges over to using like libdnf, bridges over to the RPM side of things. So you can take all of the RPM packages that obviously already exist for the you know Red Hat and Fedora ecosystems and then use those to construct a, a file system tree in OS tree as the output and then switch between those. One of the things that's interesting about RPM OS tree is it tries to also enable being able to do stuff, you know, like at client time, not just in the the image side, like you want to like add on some packages. So let's say for instance, uh, there was um, Vim installed already, but I wanted, if you wanted NeoVim, you can do, um, you can ask RPM OS tree to, to install that for you. Uh, and that totally works. It is slow. So like it has to interface with all the OS tree stuff. So basically that means it goes and gets the package and then has to build a whole new tree and then like stuff that into the, OS tree side of things and then render that out. And then by default, that's set up to be your next boot. There is the apply live option, so you can switch to it live if you want to. But by default, you'll just have to reboot to get that. So you probably don't want to install a ton of stuff that way. And, you know, that's what you expect for this type of setup. They, that's what's on the tin. Kind of install the core things that you need just as like system level utilities and everything else, you know, do in a toolbox or distro box or install via some containerized system flat or flat pack or. I did want to keep playing with that. I was curious. So one thing you can do is um, mount a writable slash user overlay, which basically lets you muck with the system, but in a way that doesn't change any files on disk and will go away when you reboot. Cool. So you can kind of screw up your running system and experiment, but then you mess it up too bad, restart, it all goes away. Mm -hmm. And then I was curious, like, what if you wanted to, like, add a driver or something? Oh, yeah. You know, like, it wasn't including the upstream, you needed it for one bit of hardware or, like, I do the weird like memory device thing that needs a driver that isn't often in, in RMFS. Wait, so when you say it was slow, you were running it from a RAM disk? <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Damn, that is slow. Okay. If it's slow when you're using a RAM disk, it's going to be slow, folks. That's, that's, like, that's best case scenario. RAM disk and fiber, just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a modern Intel CPU, RAM disk, and fiber internet. So it's sort of best case scenario. It was really just that install that was slow. Yeah, okay. The rest has been very snappy. Okay. Uh, I guess, well, no, you're right. And then like the OS tree. Yeah. Yeah. Installing NeoVim is yeah, slow. That's, but, that's true. Yeah. And then um, again, you know, you do that what? You do a lot of that at the beginning of a system. And then once you have your workstation set up, it's sort of infrequent that you install stuff. And even then, like how many, yeah, it's like, it's not really the way you're supposed to go about it. So what you can do is by default, right, like the init RAMFS that you boot with and the kernel, that's all generated upstream. It comes with the image, the tree that you clone down. Uh, but you can use RPM OS tree init RAMFS dash dash enable to allow generated a local one. Uh, so there's still Etsy slash drawcut.conf.d where you can put like custom configuration files. So you can go there and add, say like, oh, I want you to add this driver. Or make sure these drivers are here or whatever other stuff you want to do. And then you can run RPM OS tree init RAMFS dash etc dash dash force sync uh and then that will rebuild you a fresh inner ramfs do all the things and, and if you reboot, reboot and... it works yeah um so that's all possible okay which i thought was neat i'm always just curious you know like obviously for most of the intended use cases as like a you know rock solid sort of like just out of the go desktop or even maybe like a corporate workstation possibly yeah, right yeah. um and a lot of this is intended to meet these sort of like you can build the system in ci once on a build farm and then like push these out and I'm, that's great. I like that. Uh, but I'm curious about like where the edges are, what kind of things you can still do, where you can tweak it. 
There was also a nice blog post, which we'll link to, that was kind of touching on all the stuff that was new in Fedora 41 just for the atomic desktops. There's some new unofficial images, which is cool. Kinoite Mobile oh. uh, and <laughs> Cosmic Atomic, oh. which I didn't try this time, but I will be trying in the future for sure. That could be a fun combo. There's also other unofficial images, uh, XFCE Atomic and LXQT Atomic. Cool. Okay, boy. Uh, you know, uh, those last two, XFCE and LXQT, now that could be great for a VM or a remote desktop session. Mm, yeah, running on a VPS or mm-hmm. something. Something really solid, nice minimal desktop environment that's easy to stream in a remote session. Uh, so one new component uh, is BootUpD. Okay. A BootUpD is a small program that takes care of updating the bootloader. It currently supports BIOS and EFI systems, but only RPM OS tree-based systems. They're not automated. you got to kind of do it yourself. But its eventual goal is to be a OS agnostic cross-distribution update system that can handle stuff like making sure slash boot slash EFI is set up properly or, you know, uh, writing down the um, BIOS bits that you need for boot if you're not on an EFI system. Like the MBR stuff. Yep. So it's kind of an interesting, like they're adding more programmability around setting up the bootloader stuff. So now you have like a specific tool. If you do system deboot, it can kind of do this already, but there hasn't always been great options for, you know, like... Not a standardized way, really. Yeah, and especially if you're not using, right, if you're not using like DNF or going about the normal way of setting up your system where it's going to install some package and that's going to trigger some post-install script that's going to run some other scripts that's going to like call the right stuff to set up the bootloader. You kind of need tooling to do it for you. One of the other goals of BootUpD is other architecture support, which is where things get really sideways fast is when you start going to ARM or RISC-V or whatever. Like, It would be really amazing if BootUpD could support multiple package managers, if it could be some sort of standard API that understood BIOS, EFI, ARM architecture, and everything could be just interfaced within a, in a way where package managers weren't so brittle. It's not quite the same, but on the Nix OS, in the Nix OS universe, they have the idea of a boot spec. When you like build out a system generation, it kind of lists out all the stuff. Like here's where your here's what the kernel args are. Here's what the inner MFS lives in the Nix store. Here's the kernel, and that way, then different bootloader implementations can take that and render it out for their particular thing. So, like I think it's trying to attack this a similar problem um, from a uh, maybe a more a broad approach. Also, yeah. next major evolution for atomic desktops, which isn't fully here in Fedora 41, but is rapidly approaching, and you touched on this earlier, is bootable containers. Uh, our little, our pal Bootsy. Yeah. Uh, we kind of first started talking about this on the show um, back in the spring of 2024 with RHEL image mode. Yeah, from the Summit uh-huh. stuff. It was Bootsy was a big deal at the Summit. And then we started playing around with uh, the Ublue family of operating systems. Yeah. Uh, they also use bootable containers and Bootsy. So as we've been saying right now, Silverblue and Kinoite, they're using RPM OS tree, not using bootable container stuff, but they're planning to transition to using Bootsy. So, so the entire desktop is going to be a booted container? Yeah. Wow. That's <laughs> so crazy. Like you're going to live in a container soon. It's turtles all the way down. But now, I haven't. Looked into it for this update. When I last looked at Bootsy, it was mostly still targeting containers, images with, you know, made from RPM OS tree. That uh-huh. made, I don't know if that's been broadened yet. So, but right now, the basic idea is, you know, you're still using RPM OS tree to like leverage the RPM ecosystem, build yourself these atomic images, but you can just take that atomic image that you built with the OS tree stuff and then stuff that in an OCI container image. And then you can leverage like, Quay or Docker Hub or wherever you go to push do- container images and then pull that down. And then once you've pulled it down, you can just extract it. And now you have an OS tree image, you know, like yeah. directory, just like you have any other way that you get it. So then all the tooling can just kind of work from there. And I guess the advantage, right, for corporations or whatnot is they have these pipelines where they're publishing these things and they're pushing them out to systems. And so to make it bootable means that you could have a fleet of servers where you could push these things out and then they switch over and they boot from that image. And Yeah, if you're already building containers, the, yeah. the ecosystem, the, you know, yeah. the stuff you need is the same. Right. So Bootsy kind of just knows how to like interface with the RPM OS tree generated images and knows how to like go pull the kernel and inner MFS or run tools from inside of it to generate those and then tie it up with the bootloader that's been installed on the existing system. Yeah, but it's like you were saying earlier, feeling more Ublue influence here. Like, yeah. would this even be happening if Ublue wasn't out there showing them that it can be done and is being done? It's a good question. And I'm, I'm happy to see it. It's not a criticism at all. I think this is, this is, in fact, 
a, a kind of a beautiful way that free software can work. It was neat that it was e- so easy to get going to. So like I was on my RPM OS tree version uh, and I, and, you know, I did the RPM OS tree install uh, Bootsy, got that rebooted, got that there. Uh, and then you just sort of tell it to install and you point it at a Docker repo. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Like just like you would put in a Docker compose file, you know, like the image, the repo and image name. You just tell it like, hey, make this my system. And then it does it and it queues it up for the next boot and you reboot and boom, now you got a Bootsy system going. Yeah. Um, one thing that stood out to me, I haven't, there's like a lot, I want to play more with this. It's it, it's all fascinating. It does kind of feel like this is taking the image approach like to the next level. You know, where RPM OS tree added that kind of like client side stuff. I don't know how prevalent that is on the Bootsy side of things, at least now. I get the feeling, at least from the docs I could find, that it's it's going to push you even more to the like, well, you need to, if you want a new inner MFS, you build a new container image that has the inner MFS that you want, which you can do locally. So, you know, the, the, the new version of like doing local changes to add your own driver is forking from the image you downloaded, adding, you know, rebuilding the inner M- MFS on a new layer and booting that, which is totally fine. And if you're already familiar with containers, that's probably easier to deal with than a lot of other ways about handling that setup. So this is what... I think you and I find interesting about this is it's not necessarily our preferred way to build a system, but the reality is there is a ginormous industry of professionals that have been trained on container workflows. And it's been the focus of Red Hat's training now for quite a while. And one of the things that was clear at Red Hat Summit this summer is they are just extending container workflows to everything. And what it does mean is that people who are not Linux systems experts are still at least to some degree, have access to the tooling that allows them to assemble Linux systems, maintain Linux systems, patch Linux systems in a way that they can just use the tools they already understand and don't have to learn and become a Linux person. Yeah, it might feel like a lot if all you've ever done is apt or regular DNF, but if you're building container images all day and shipping those and stuff... It's it's, easier, actually. But for us that that we've come at it from the old days where... You know, you're a system administrator and you build it up and it's like, well, why are you containerizing all this stuff with all these layers? Because that's the workflow that Red Hat's been training them for the last decade. And now you've got a whole industry of professionals that know what containers are and how they work and snap into their workflow. So it's it's fascinating to see them kind of position this to make this available to these types of professionals. Well, and I could see a version where, um, you know, I was complaining about the installer and that doesn't really matter. You don't install it as much. You know, I'm installing a bunch of them right now to review them, but otherwise you probably don't need to worry about it so much. But I would hope that eventually there'd be a streamlined process. You might be able to do it today. I just haven't looked at all the underlying pieces, but with that boot up D stuff and Bootsy, like, could I just, you know, boot up whatever old live CD, format myself some Fedora partitions, uh, use boot up D to put my bootloader on there. And then use Bootsy from the live environment to download the container image and then write out the, that for the new system, tie up the bootloader stuff and be done. You know, just like there, there we go. Now I, I think so. That, I think so. That seems great. And you could just bypass the slow installer. Yeah, that would be the type of installation you and I would prefer, I think. And I think you could do that. We, I don't know if we've actually tried it. I don't think we have tried it, but I think you're right. And as these tools develop, I think that's, just, you know, the flexibility and like the, the neat things you'll be able to do are just going to increase, which... I'm excited about that. Yeah. Because it's it's sort of fun because you just boot any other OS, any other Linux OS, and then you just take over. <laughs> it's, always, it's always great. And, you know, like, um, I, th- I think part of the thing, they were waiting for CI to catch up because uh, they needed the new images generated with DNF5 and with Bootsy built into them. And those were being pushed to some other repo that wasn't the official one. I don't know the details, but it's coming. But, like, there's a, you know, you can now, once you've got the Bootsy stuff, you can switch to a U-Blue image, no problem. You can switch to that unofficial cosmic atomic build, no problem. Like, it's it's just one command in a reboot. Mm, that's, yeah, there's advantages to that. I'm really glad you tried out the Kino Knight and dug into that, Wes, because uh, it makes me feel really good about where they're going with all this. Now, um, did you have any problems? Did anything break? Did anything not work? Was there any negatives in your in your time at exploring? No, not really. No, it's pretty much rock solid. Yeah, that's nice to hear. Well, then, um, I, there's just one left. You'll have to find. You'll have to wait just a, a brief moment to find out uh, what I deployed. This spot right here. This could be yours if you have a product, a business, a service, and you'd like to feature it on Linux Unplugged. Email me, Chris at JupiterBroadcasting.com. 
I'd love to talk to you. I think it'd be great to have somebody out there in the community that sponsors this show. I'll make a great deal, too, since it has been the ad winter for a little bit. But if you don't have a product, if you don't have something to sell, you can still support the show. The new annual membership supports all the shows on the network. I'll have a link in the show notes. You get access to all the shows for every podcast, their special features, and their ad-free feeds. And you get one month for free with the annual membership. Of course, you can just support this show directly at linuxunplugcom slash membership. You get the ad-free feed, which is all tidied up by Drew. Or you get the bootleg, which is everything. And we pack a ton of extra content into that. Extra news stories and discussions. Stuff that's just for our members. You get access to it either way with the annual membership, a party yeah, with the Jupiter party, or when you go to linuxunplugcom slash membership. You can also boost, of course. Any messages above 2,000 sats, we try to get those on the air and read them. That goes to each one of us, including Editor Drew. And it's a way to support us directly on your terms, on your schedule, at the amount you like. You know, for those of you who like to set their own terms. The membership's available for the autopilot system, and you just set it and forget it. And the boosts are those who are a little more active, who like to kind of, instead of do the ongoing thing, support at the value they feel it is worth at the time. That's the whole idea with value for value. I won't take any more of your time. If you enjoyed this episode, you got some value from the podcast, please consider participating in one way or another. And now, back to the show. Now, Chris, we uh, each went in directions maybe you didn't expect. And of course, Wes did some crazy stuff. But I know you have some crazy stuff in you, too. What did you get up to? I did kick around the uh, standard workstation version, which is great, of course, this release. But uh, I looked up the Asahi project and I wanted to see if they had officially released for Fedora 41. And it looks like it's not actually sanctioned yet. It hasn't been fully like blessed and released yet. They're still just kind of monitoring things. So I went ahead and did the right thing and just upgraded right to Asahi 41. And that a boy. It was absolutely smooth. And this is my second major upgrade of the OS because I think I started with Fedora 39, maybe even 38. But I know I started with 39, brought that sucker up to 40, used that about, you know, two, three times a week. So pretty frequently for the whole release. And now I've brought that up to Fedora 41. And literally not a single error, not a complaint about any package conflicts. That's great. Nothing. Um, and really simple cleanup afterwards and everything like that. Of course, now I've got Plasma 6.22 or 6.2.2, I should say. Not 22, 6.2.2. Using Wayland, OVS. I will say, you know, if you are going to be doing this style of um, in-place major version upgrade, TNF's probably the package manager you do want. It's nice, too, because then you can be like, hey, I'd like to review all of the new config files and see if I should merge them. And sure enough, two of them in there were fixing cups problems. And that was really nice to see. So this is on my Apple M1 Max MacBook. It's a 16-inch from 2021. It's got uh, 64 gigs of RAM, oh. and it's got uh, the M1 Max Ice Storm processor. So it's it's a good amount of cores. I don't actually know what it is. And then with Asahi Linux, you're using Linux 611.0-400. And um, it's got full graphic support. But even a bigger deal, boys, is I can finally use my speakers. Wow. Did you were you super choosy on what you played first? Uh I think I I think I went to YouTube and searched for music and then I went and I listened to some podcasts and I just kind of did a sampling and then I installed some games. So it was like I wanted to hear the range of it because while this has been around for a minute now, I felt like the 41 time period was when it was safe to finally install this because when they first started developing this, it turned out that they could destroy the speaker. That you could drive it way beyond what you should be able to and blow them out. And some of the first development tests, they immediately blew out the speakers on their MacBooks. Yeah. Unlike, I guess, some of the other ways that the M systems work, like this time, you got like a really raw interface to just be able to do whatever you want with the speaker. And then it turns out that, what, there's like Mac OS software running that's actually handling, making sure things EQ right and transients aren't don't go for too long and too loud. And So it turns out that there's a lot of lift being done in software to massage the sound. And so it's not fully working yet for all of the uh, MacBooks, but a lot of the M1, M2 series, you're pretty much set. And mine was as well. So there was just a package called Asahi Audio, Asahi-Audio that I had to install. And it took care of everything. It sets up the uh, wire plumber DSP profiles that you need uh, because it's an array of speakers in this stupid laptop. And it installs a couple of dependencies that are required to do some of the audio processing. And this is where 
you can have a weird experience because you can have the same machine where you're in Mac OS and then you boot into Linux and the two sound different. It's the same hardware, but they sound different. And it comes down to taste. And the team that writes the Asahi audio driver writes on the GitHub here. While it is evident that Apple put immense amount of effort into ensuring these machines have good sound, they tried a little too hard. On top of being tuned for an exaggerated human curve, Mac OS makes use of psychoacoustic ba- bass enhancements, dynamic range compression, and spatialization tricks to spice up the acoustic profile of these machines. Unfortunately, not only does this color the sound in a way that is reminiscent of early Beats headphones, Apple actually has a bug in their psychoacoustic bass processor that causes audible artifacts. So this whole setup is quite, le- quite simply unacceptable for anything but the most casual of listening. We aim to deliver a mostly flat response curve with an audible range that will faithfully reproduce source material without adding excessive amounts of color. Well, you know, it's a difference of opinion, but you might think that the trillion dollar company that literally has a team of audio scientists maybe knows what they're doing because vocals stink now. Vocals are muddier. They're not as crisp or clear. And uh, it doesn't sound as good. It works, though. So I'm very happy. And it's still better than most laptop speakers. I will say it does like the the beats thing and the bass enhancement. That rings true to me. It does like just from listening to the new. They do have color. Yeah. But it also strikes me that like probably consumers want that. Like, well, that's just probably put it on good headphones or like your monitor speakers if you're going to mix and you need flat or I don't know. Right. A developer looked at this and a developer said this is technically not accurate. And Apple looked at this and said, we're going to send this out to consumers and we're going to study what their reaction is. And then we're going to fine tune this in an acoustically defined space that is meant to monitor this and hear how and listen how humans hear. And then we're going to tweak this until we just get it to, just right. And we'll have a team of people working on this for a year. And then we'll send that feedback back, back to the audio people. And since they have no idea what we're going to come, what kind of conclusion we're going to come to, they're just going to build the system so that we can define it any way we want and we can massage it over time. So what's your uh, Asahi fork going to be called? Yeah, I know, right? Asahi, uh, uh, what do they call it? Colorful edition? Um, but you know what? It's still pretty good sound. Games pl- sound fine. You know, It's really just vocals that I have the biggest complaint with. Am and, I picking up right that this is powered by uh, Speaker Safety D? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you heard me say it. And boys, it's real. <laughs> Gaming. Gaming in, in Asahi 41 is just a Steam package install away. And what's happening on the back end is incredible. They call it the Asahi Game Playing Toolkit. It integrates Vulkan 1.3, x86 emulation, Proton for Windows compatibility, and OpenCL 3.0. And you just DNF installs Steam. And it's installing the Thex emulator which emulates x86 on ARM like Rosetta does for Mac OS. Nuts. It's using Wine to translate the Windows API calls and DXVK, and of course VK3D, to translate DirectX to Vulkan. That any of this works at all is magic. It gets better. There's a curveball in here. Memory page sizes. Oh, right. So operating systems allocate memory in fixed size pages. And if an application expects a smaller page size than the system uses, they'll break. There's like an it's an insufficient alignment of allocations essentially. And the problem here is is that x86 expects 4K pages, but Apple M series use 16K page sizes. So the nice part is is Linux can work with either, but it cannot mix them. But it can virtualize them. So they actually have a teeny tiny virtual machine called MUVM that's passing through the GPU and your game controller devices, all the hardware. And then that tiny little MUVM is emulating 4K page sizes on top of a 16K page size. There's even a VM in here just for the memory So you run another Linux kernel with the right page size for x86 to do your translation. Wow. Yeah, and then FX is emulating the actual x86 to ARM calls. Right, okay. (laughs) It's wild. It, this That's sounds fun. super fragile. <laughs> so it's not fantastic. You know, um, things work, though, surprisingly well. 
I'll tell you where what's going to work really good is games in your repo. So like Xenotic and Tuxcart and anything that's in your repo that's open source and a lot of the flat packs that have ARM versions, they're going to work really good. But a lot of the Steam games work too. So after you DNF install Steam and you get it all set up and you turn on Proton emulation for all the titles, I played No Man's Sky, Fallout 4 works, I played Race the Sun, um, I played Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, whatever the latest one is that's essentially Turtles in Time, um, played all of those with no problem. A couple of games didn't execute that normally do execute just fine under Proton, so it, I'd say it's like 75%, maybe even 70%. But, I'm not like an expert on this, but I believe now, with this setup, with this game toolkit, there's actually more games available on the M hardware under Linux than under Mac OS itself, which is absolutely remarkable if you think about it, because if 60-ish percent of my Proton, 70-ish percent of my Proton games work now on, on Linux, on the M1, well, that crushes the availability <laughs> of this on Mac OS. Yeah. And it's a, incredible that they've pulled this off. Now, I think where this really, really, really hits the actual, like, full, you know, 95% area is when this has had a little more development, so probably gets even better in Fedora 42 and even, you know, probably there in Fedora 43, so we're looking a little bit out, but also I think when you got a little bit better GPU hardware, you know, when the Asahi project starts working on M3 and M4 support in 2025, which is what I've seen um, is the plan, then you're going to have even better, more capable GPUs. But again, I'm on an M1 system here and I'm playing these games and it doesn't feel any different than when I'm playing them on an x86 system. Uh, there was one game I played after a while it got a little laggy. And I think if I swapped out the Proton runtime, I may have had a better go at it. I just used like whatever the latest version was. Right. I was just blown away by it. And then I wouldn't even have thought necessarily to try. So it's such a smooth system. Wi Fi works, sleep works, Bluetooth works, gaming works, screen brightness. Sound and volume control, the hotkeys work, you know, all of the, you know, function keys work. Um, and I should have you try it, Wes, but I swear it feels like the snappiest version of Plasma. Maybe it's the disc in this thing. Maybe it's the drivers in KWIN, but everything opens a little bit faster, like console and Dolphin. They all appear on the screen just a little bit fast, and it's not just the timing of the effects. There's something different about it. It's like it. You can you can never throw it. It's always delivering. The interface is always snappy, more so than any of my x86 plasma systems. Um, so in a way, it's it's more and more becoming like one of my go-to Linux systems now. What does it need to cross the line where it wouldn't be crazy to buy an M series laptop yeah. with the intention of just primarily using Asahi? Well, at this point, M3, M4 support. Right, because yeah. if you're spending this kind of money, you know, or unless you want to get used and get an M1, you're going to have a good time. You're, you're, if you were, say, to buy used right now and save some money, just about darn near everything works. What you're really lacking are a lot of the native apps. It may be possible with Fex to start emulating day-to-day -day desktop applications too. I just don't know how to point the tool at that, but that's it's not just for games. Um, so there's, you know, like, so a lot of stuff I'm doing in the browser. I, I have a pin tab for a lot of things. Which works surprisingly well, so I'm not really actually missing out on much. And I end up doing that a fair amount on even on my x86 machines these days. And I don't think still there's some things that, you know, if I'm honest and I was really using this every day, it's why I don't use it every day is I don't think I can hook up a Thunderbolt dock or something. I don't think I can hook up a bunch of external displays yet. Might be different on the Mini, but I don't I don't think so on the MacBook Pro Max. So there might be a few things like that that are still not there. But if you're just looking, if you were looking to buy a used M1 Max on eBay, and you just wanted something that's going to get great battery life, incredible performance that never gets hot, you never hear the fan, it feels super fast when you use it, and it can play a lot of games that you might already have in your library, and you can still dual boot into macOS if you need to. Like, it checks all those boxes. It's just, you know, the edge cases. You want to start hooking up multiple monitors, and you need a bunch of x86 apps, or you want to do some AI workload, or whatever it might be, or you want to play the absolute latest game that just came out. It's not quite there yet. But what's really nice about Fedora's Asahi spin is it's the premium experience, right? That's why I choose to use Fedora and continue to use Fedora and not reload it with something else. 
because when they got the game kit ready, it was just DNF install Steam. Where, like, if I'm on Ubuntu or if I'm on Arch or another distribution, I have to go through a whole bunch of hoops. I'm adding repos. I'm doing all kinds of stuff. But the team is publishing and pushing stuff in, like, an Asahi repo. And so all that stuff that they're working on is just a DNF away from me, all the, all the fixes. And it's, it's really, like, the premier way to experience Linux on this M1 hardware. You can do it in other distributions and it still works great. But you really feel like you're getting... You're just like right downstream of what the developers are publishing. So as soon as they figure something out or they make life easier, it's like, boom, it's right there in Fedora. And then it usually gets to the other distros too. But So the this is one of my favorite spins because it takes what, are, what is really nice hardware and it makes Linux extremely accessible to them. The installation is really straightforward. It It is really solid on the Mac mini, which could make for a great little headless server at this point. Mm. And Plasma 6.2.2 on this hardware with KWIN is so smooth and so clean. It's one of the best experiences. Really, really like it. And, you know, of course, DNF5 was fantastic. A little bit faster, a little bit cleaner output. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's rare that I don't go through this process and at least have some criticisms. But I really don't because what's what doesn't work and I would say what criticisms I do have, well, that's outside the Fedora project. Like they don't determine if Element makes an ARM version, right? They don't they don't drive that. They don't they don't make a decision if Slack makes an ARM version. It's outside their control. They're just making the best ARM workstation out there right now, I think. Just hands down. I think they're making the best ARM Linux workstation out there. And if you've got access to the hardware, it's totally worth a try. So if you give Fedora 41 a try. Or if you try out one of the spins that we didn't try, boost it and let us know how it went, good or bad. We want to hear it. And now it is time for the boost. If you're new to boosting, uh, you can figure out how to send in a boost along with all these other fantastic fellas. Uh, JupiterBroadcasting.com slash boost. We have a little bit of a primer there on how to get involved in the podcasting 2.0 value for value love train. I like that. Okay. All right. <laughs> Just randomly go. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it used to be a bus for Brent, but now it's a train. <laughs> it's evolving. Jert Sampson is our baller booster. Hey, rich lobster! He got it on sale this week. It's a great one. 56,500 sats. I like it. He says, my favorite Seuss release would have to be 9.3. If only because it was my first real full-time entry into desktop Linux. I stuck with it for a long time, and I have fond memories of figuring out how to make it work uh, back many years ago when I was in high school. Aww. I've been using Linux and listening to Last and Linux Unplugged ever since. These days, I mostly run Nix OS, but was on Tumbleweed prior, and that was pretty rock solid. Thanks for all the shows over the years. I love the technical Nix content. And by the way, this is a zip code boost. You just have to change that last trailing zero to a leading zero. Uh oh, Wes. Oh, okay. yes. Zip code is a better deal. You better get looking. Did you bring the map? Okay. Nope. That's not the map, Wes. <laughs> Where's the map? Where's the map? You didn't bring the map? Oh. Oh, there it is. You brought I the map. I got the fake out. Oh, you faked me out so bad. Yeah, I had my Kindle. You thought that was where the map was, but no. All right, so where is Mr. Sampson? West Payne? Uh, this would appear to be a zip code, a 05650 in Washington County, Vermont. Well, hello, Washington County, Vermont. C- can I just say there are too many Washingtons over there? <laughs> yeah, we really went, we went sort of silly with it, didn't we? We really did. I feel like, you know, we, we got like something in common. We both live in a place called Washington, even if it's not the state. Thanks for boosting in. Yes. And I agree. 9.3 was a really, really good release. And as I'm sure you recall, that's when it came in those fold out CD displays. So you would you would open it up and there would be CD after CD after CD in there because, of course, I could only fit 600 megabytes on there. And uh, back in that era, too, depending on what kit you bought, it would come with a couple of multi-hundred page books, manuals, to tell you how to use it all. It's really something. We'll be talking more about it, so please do keep in, keep boosting in your uh, favorite versions of SUS. We're collecting them now and taking notes because it'll be very relevant for the next episode, if all goes as planned. Isn't that right, Brent? Uh, yeah. I go Sienna boosts in with 42,021 sets. The answer to the ultimate question. Greetings from Greece. 
I've built a NixOS configuration with Nextcloud and easy remote peer-to-peer access using Wholesale at Wholesale.io. That's a H-O-L-E-S-A-I-L. Peer-to-peer tunnel for instant access. Create peer-to-peer tunnels instantly that bypass network firewalls, NAT restrictions, and expose your local network to the internet securely. No dynamic DNS required, 100% free open source. My goal is to make it very easy for anyone to self-host Nextcloud. The first version is available for Raspberry Pi 4 with automatic mounting of USB devices inside Nextcloud. Mm. The code is available on GitHub. We'll have a link in the show notes. Also, next week, I'm presenting it at an open source software conference here in Greece. P.S. I first heard about Nix and NixOS from your podcast. Oh, that's great. Well, good luck with the presentation. Sounds awesome. Yeah, you know what I... What I think is really clever, too, is just passing USB storage through to a NextCloud instance means that you could give somebody a Raspberry Pi and then just tell them, add your own disk. Brian Lee? Yeah, this feels impressive to me. I would love to see the talk. If it, it gets recorded, please uh, boost in and send us that recording. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Please do link it up. Now, Crashmaster boosted in a row of ducks. Simply saying, open Sousa Tumbleweed. Still use it. Uh huh. All Tumble, right. Tumbleweed check it. So we got a 9.3. I'm writing all these down because it will be relevant later. So we got a 9.3 and we got one tumbleweed so far. Okay. Tumbleweed. I figure we're going to get the majority tumbleweed, but we'll see. We'll see. Bun comes in with 5,000 sats. That's a jar jar boost. You're so boost. Uh, and he writes I think my longest used distro has been Debian when I was new to Linux. I've used Linux Mint, Arch, and now. Nix. <laughs> Very nice. Interesting escalation there, too. <laughs> like the Debian safe haven for a while, which I spent many years in, too, in Debian land. Great great way to, like, wet your sysadmin skills, kind of, yep. you know, get, get used to things. And back in the day, too, when we didn't have DNF or YUM, apt was so superior to straight up RPM where you had to self-resolve dependencies. It was n- night and day. And then, you know, you start looking for something that's a little nicer on the desktop, so you end up on Mint, but then you want something that has a little more access and more fresh packages and bigger ecosystem. You end up on Arch, and then boom, Nix. There's a path there. I like it. It's very good. The immunologist boosts in with 5,556 sats. Everything's under control. Follow-up boost, also known as a faloost. <laughs> <laughs> Raspberry Pi OS is the Linux OS which I use technically the longest, but uh, sporadically. First for the Retro Pi, and since then, hosting a Nextcloud Snap. Hmm. Started with OpenSUSE Leap as my first desktop Linux running on my main laptop. Upgraded to Tumbleweed. Um, now running Micro OS Desktop GNOME uh, Aeon okay. since the summer, and I'm very happy with it. Full disk encryption and immutability are both great. Also, it made me finally learn DistroBox. So far, Aeon is my favorite OpenSUSE distro. All right, I'm writing it down then. Which makes it my favorite overall distro as well, since the only non-OpenSUSE distro OS I've ever even used is Raspberry Pi OS. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, though. Falus, that's funny, the immunologist. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Now, Distro Stu sent in an almost Spaceballs boost. One, two, three, four, six Satoshis. Yeah, let's give it to him. So the combination is one, two, three, four, five. Since you asked, mm, here's my main driver history. Red Hat for about two years. Ubuntu for seven years. Then Arch for 18 years. And NixOS for one year. Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) Uh-oh. It's been GNOME for pretty much all of it. And I actually miss Arch, but NixOS has been a fun shakeup. Could always throw in a distro box, I suppose. You know? Hey, can I just say that's a lot of years when you add them all up together? I wonder if Arch would be one of my longest, too. Many, many years, because it, ra- it was basically from the Arch challenge to Nix. You can't run a stable system on Arch. What are you talking about? It can't be done, Wes. It can't be Especially done. Especially not a server. Thank you, Distro Stu. Uh, that's really interesting. Seven years on Ubuntu is no joke either, really. Open source account that came in with a Jar Jar boost. You're so boost. 5,000 sats. Uh, if there are people in the southeast Washington or within driving distance of Walla Walla, Washington, I would be happy to host a meetup for episode 600. Oh, okay, open source. Accountant? You know, we're technically with them. Just... I know, right? Hmm. You know, I don't know if I've... Well, I must have been. I, I'm sure I've been to Walla Walla, but I don't know if I've been to Walla Walla. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Which, which yeah. Washington is he talking about here? There's so many. Our Washington. Washington State, right here in the Pacific <laughs> Northwest. Come on. Right here. The one with the R. Yeah. Uh, Brett Boosin with 5,000 sets. You're so boost. 
If anyone is in the Fort Walton Beach, Florida area, they can check out Emerald Coast Linux user group at eclinux.org. We've been meeting for over a year now, thanks to JB Inspiration. That's great. Also, all this Nix talk has kind of been getting on my nerves. Sorry. So much so that I had to install it and see what the fuss was about. <laughs> oh, no, I'm it's really working. sorry now. <laughs> I'm not completely sold, but I'm enjoying learning new things. Right on. Keep up the great work. That's the attitude, right? It's a, it's a journey. It's a journey, and as long as you're willing to walk that journey and enjoy it. The lunch fryer sends in a row of ducks. <laughs> you guys like that one? <laughs> yeah. I've been a Tumbleweed user for a few years now. The combination of ButterFS snapshots with Snapper and transactional updates at a micro OS and OpenQA tested images makes Tumbleweed one of the most bulletproof systems I've ever used. I use transactional updates.timer to automatically update my system around midnight and reboot manager will trigger a reboot around 4 a.m. if there are any updates. I wake up every morning to a freshly updated and rebooted system. I rarely ever need to run a manual zipper. I think we need to see if we can um, hire the lunging <laughs> yeah, fryer to super fancy. maybe manage Brent's system. Yeah, there you go. That would be a great idea because, uh, you know, that sounds like a pretty attractive setup, I have to say. So I did a plus one here for Tumbleweed. Um, and it's nice to hear somebody actively kind of leaning into the ButterFS snapshot stuff. Like, I know it's a feature out there, but it's nice to hear somebody actually leaning into that. That's pretty great. Appreciate that. Thank you for the boost, uh, Fryer. I love the name, too. Now, I'm going to say the next name is Laudenpax. Laudenpax. 2,222 sats. My longest running Linux was Manjaro. I had that for almost three years, but I moved to Nix OS over a year ago, thanks to you guys. <laughs> We're so sorry. You know, it's worth pointing out, we didn't say only Nix OS users right now. <laughs> <laughs> Boost him. Uh, changed my desktop, my laptop, and now my home server. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that story every time, too. Uh, I've never looked back. Hoping to convert my friends to the Nix way of life as well. <laughs> Love good it. Good luck. Dude's on a rampage, and I am here for it. Love I it. think that's so good. Thank you. Moon Knight comes in with 2,001 Satoshis. My longest running Linux box is a Pi Hole. Been running it on a Pi 3B for something like seven or eight years now. Great little box. I never had to touch it outside the initial configuration. Oh, boy. Fancy. Talk about return on value there for, uh -huh. for eight years or so. Think about all the ads that thing's blocked. <laughs> you know, I think I'm on year four of mine. And it might even be booting from an SD card or something. I don't know. It's not a totally, like, blessed setup anymore. <laughs> but it's incredible. It just runs. It just runs. And every now and then I log in, I add, like, a manual DHCP reservation or something like that. But that's about it. Thank you for the boost. Sam H. boosted in uh, 9,001 Satoshis. It's over 9,000! Thank you. Thank you for talking about Audio Bookshelf. I've been running it since you discussed it in Linux Unplugged 547, and it's been excellent. In surprisingly little time, I had it running on Nix OS and imported all my audiobooks with Libation, and I haven't looked back. Well done, Sam. That's well, rad. Uh, also, very, very, very happy with my Audio Bookshelf setup as well still. I think Libation is the better way to go because the metadata extracts from Audible just displays better by default in Open Bookshelf. The Android app for Open Bookshelf has a couple of really neat features, one of them being that you can go into the settings and you can say that if I start the book after a certain period of time, like 9 p.m., or for me, I set it at 9.30, automatically start a sleep timer. Another thing that the Android app does that the iOS app does not do is the Android app, while not every single time, but most often will fade out for the last 10 seconds. It fades out. Whereas the iOS app just hard stops. But all of that together, is it's just really so fantastic. Along the same lines of happy that I am with Audio Bookshelf, I'm going to mention it one more time. It's Ursats TV, and it gives you your ability to create your own live TV stations, essentially from your media collection. So I have about 10 channels, and they play different stuff. Like I have a Star Trek channel. I have channels for individual Star Trek shows. I have like a 90s TV that's got Seinfeld and Home Improvement. and Personal question. Uh, do you have a Linux Action Show channel? Oh, God, no, no. <laughs> uh, I cannot stand myself. But uh, I, so I just if you're loving Audiobook Shelf, you might love Ursats TV too because I have been really thrilled with it. 
I do love how every time you talk about Airsats TV, the number of channels you have goes up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, because I realize, like, I'll be watching a show and I'll be like, I'll tune a channel and be like, oh, I kind of wish I would have gotten this show. And I'm like, oh, I could just, I can just make a channel for that show. Do you have a Curb channel yet? That's a good idea. I like the idea that you are refusing to watch things via Jellyfin, except via loading them into Earthsets TV channels. And watching them live. Yeah. yeah. Well, the stuff that I'm watching sequentially, but stuff like the 90s television shows or Star Trek that I've seen a hundred times, it's perfect for that kind of thing. Producer Jeff PJ comes in with 12,100 sets. Arch was my longest running distro, nearly 10 years on my old System 76 Bonobes. But as for SUSE, I can't remember what version of OpenSUSE Leap I used, but it was around 27 or 2019. I ran it on my HTPC, HTPC server, so a media server. I really enjoyed having Yast, but it was slow compared to other distros, sadly. Yeah, yeah, especially like the post-configuration stuff Yast did. That was slow. Got it for about two years, and I put Arch on that machine. And I just replaced Arch with Nix OS last month. <laughs> <laughs> I think I maybe we should God, uh, like write a up. letter to the Arch folks with like, there's an apology. <laughs> yeah. Well done, PJ. Well done there. Um, I like to hear it. I also had for just a brief period of time, uh, Seuss on a media center PC because it was so quick and yes yeah, to set up all the mount points for Samba and NFS and just do it all in one UI and you hit apply and it was really nice. And it's like, yeah, I'll try this. The one, the only hybrid sarcasm comes in with 5,000 sats. You're so boost. My sats budget is a bit tight at the moment, so I'm repurposing some sats for a self-hosted boost about Nextcloud. Mm. But I couldn't just not boost into love. <laughs> so happy Tuesday, as in Sunday. <laughs> ah, thank you, hybrid. And I guess uh, go check out uh, self-hosted. Yeah. If you want to go see what I, hybrid set over there. I tore down my Nextcloud install and built it back, hopefully, for the last time. And I cover that in there. Oh, Vmax boosted in a Spaceballs boost. Yes, that's amazing. I've got the same combination on my luggage. Boosting in support of episode 600 meetups, a late February brunch with other listeners will be a good way to celebrate. I set up a little rally instance to organize my little corner of the Midwest and posted it in the Matrix chat. Feel free to include it in the show notes. Oh, we're going to have to go find that somewhere. Nice. Great initiative. Yeah, okay. So we've gotten a couple of people now. So I will start getting more serious about organizing the 600. I think we've heard three or four people that are willing to do it. Yeah. That's good enough in my book. We may do one ourselves as well. Um, and it'd be fun to like pull them in live. On Sunday, right? The idea is episode 600 on Sunday. We get together. We pull people in live from their meetups. It could be a lot of fun. We'll see. Um, I'll try to get more information and uh, pass it along. Mahandas comes in with 8,310 sats. Longtime listener, first time booster. Hey, that's n nice work. Thank you for taking that journey. I know it can be a treacherous one. And they're on Podverse, too. Nice. Thanks for the great content. I've learned a lot over the years. I think the first time I saw Jupiter Broadcasting was on YouTube. It was an episode of Linux Action Show where Chris and Brian were reviewing an open so open SUSE release, which was my favorite distro at the time. The boost amount is my postcode. Hint, it is north of the Arctic Circle. Yes, zip code is a better deal. Okay, let's get the um, extended map out. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. This one's just California, which that's not super useful. Thank you, Daz, for that boost. Congratulations on getting Podverse working with Boosting 2. And, jeez, uh, since Brian and I were talking about OpenSUSE on YouTube, that's a long time, friend. It's a long time. Be fun to go see what you thought of uh, some older releases. And how did you now pronounce it? How did you get that coffee stain on the top of the map? You're going to have a problem. You're gonna... uh, yeah, it has blotted out some of these. Yeah, that's not good. Is that coffee or is that beer even? I can't tell. It smells like whiskey. <laughs> well, you know, it can be multiple things. <laughs> it's a common spill spot. Yeah, I guess so. That is true. That is true. Um, whoa, watch out. Watch yeah, out. I, I opened the wrong side. This is Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I'm getting a lot of options here. Um, no, did they say north of the... North of the Arctic Circle, West Bank. See, that's what's throwing me here, because none of my... I'm getting, getting Belgium. A, that doesn't seem right. It's a postcode in numbers, right? So is it in Alaska, but north of the... Is that a thing? What? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're going to need some help with this one. 
right? <laughs> yeah, but no, I see what you're saying, Brent. <laughs> I don't think we're going to crack it. I think we finally... This is the yeah, first time. I'm, uh, my map skills are a little behind. It's been a while, so I'm glad we're back on the whole zip code thing. I will pr- do some practice yes. off hours. We do love the zip code boost. So, uh, and that's, I think, the first time the map's ever been thrown. Although, there's coffee, whiskey, and beer stains on there, so that could explain some of it. Yeah, after this failure, I might have to make some more stains. Thank you, Mr. Dawes. Appreciate that boost. Thank you for listening for so long, too. A VT52 comes in with 16,384 cents. Oh, this is Cajun Spice. Loving this Nick's content. Also, got my first Meshtastic node running, and I see oh, nodes yes. from North Bend to South Tacoma to Bremerton to do Snohomish. Wow. Though Bremerton is a bit cheaty. It's over MQTT. Oh, you got MQTT working with it as well. That's the way to extend the range right there. You know, you guys might be able to make contact. You're you know? right. You never know. Oh, that would be neat. Yeah. Well done. If you see uh, Nick's OS, by the way, then that's me. <laughs> I, by the way, when we do local meetups, especially like at Linux Fest, I'd like all of us to bring our Meshtastic gear. So we're, this is going to come back up again in the future, too. Okay. And so VT was the person who set up the BBS at pebcac.lol. Thank you. It fell into disuse and then went casters up, but I'd be more than happy to get it up again and give you sysop creds. Or if you'd rather, I'm happy to consult or help get stuff set up on your own info. Same w- goes for IRC. I wouldn't mind seeing it running again just so we could take a look at what its capabilities are and then we would decide what we want to do from there. For what it's worth, the BBS software I was using has an integrated IRC bridge if that's something that you'd be interested in. Oh, boy. And then we then we bridge that to Matrix. Yeah, and, and it's a whole big thing. <laughs> VT, thank you. Yeah, if you do have time to set it up, I wouldn't mind poking at it again because I think that could be a fun thing we could do for episode 600 as well. Thank you, and th- thank you for the boost, too. Tomato sends in our third Spaceballs boost. Hell was that? Spaceball one. They've gone to plaid. Thanks for the Meshtastic show. It inspired me to get some equipment as well, which just arrived. So far, I don't see much, but I do have a nearby friend who wants to try a node too, so I'll have someone to talk to soon enough. I do like the idea of having local meetups for episode 600, by the way. I'd be willing to try to organize one in the Paris region. Oh! Are we saying, like, Paris, Paris? Is that the only Paris we're talking about? Or is there, like, a Paris in Wisconsin or something? That'd be great. Do you mean if there was a Paris in Wisconsin? Well, both. Okay. Great. That's amazing. Yes. All right. Okay. Maybe we should ditch our local meetup for that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let, <laughs> all right, boys. I'm, I'm in. <laughs> um, if you guys don't mind, I think we pull one up. Mr. Cospelin, he was under the 2000 sat cutoff, but... He's on topic here this week. Uh, he writes for nine, 999 SAS. I've been running SUSE as a daily driver since the Windows XP era. I started with a desktop setup on a Pentium 3 666 megahertz machine with 256 megabytes of RAM. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Over the years, I used it first with VSFTP, then no machine, all while utilizing port forwarding. Later, I repurposed the machine as a firewall, opening ports up for VSFTP and also for no machine. Throughout this time, I consistently chose SUSE as my desktop and server operating system. On my desktop, I'm currently running Tumbleweed, just like my mom started using this summer. Meanwhile, I'm running Leap on the server side. You know, I don't think we had anybody say they were actively using Leap right now, but I'm writing Leap down, Cos. We got one Leap. Um, We'll explain why we're writing these down next week. Um, He goes on to finish up with, uh, I take the fun in automating my server setup through uh, auto Yast installations. Yes! Every new version of Leap triggers a fresh auto Yast install for me. Even for fun, I've set up some diskless XMRE miners, uh, which is a cryptocurrency mining program on Tumbleweed, accessible via Pixie. Each update prompts an automatic auto Yast run with my virtual machines, and I do 99% of the time I deploy with PXE installs. That's pretty cool. I wish we were using Pixie and, uh, and network booting more in the studio. It'd be pretty neat if these all these machines in here could just reboot and deploy a, a fresh new image after an update's come out. That's a pretty slick setup, so I wanted to pull that forward. Can you give us, uh, new folks, a little primer on auto Yast? What is this? Sounds cool. Yeah, well, it's what it sounds like. It's uh, an answer file, and then auto Yast, I think, maybe it's just Yast, runs that and does all the automated installations and answers the questions, creates the user, selects the packages, you know, that kind of thing. So you can do automated SUSE deployments. Uh, okay. I've um, attempted to repair my failure slightly. Oh, so you brought the map back out, you I, Yeah, I did, yeah. Actually, oh, I yeah, never the... put it away. I kind of just hid it from you. That's how the Ow! more stains Ow! go. Jeez, Wes. 
Ow! Uh, yeah, okay, so, uh, Kabelvag in Norway. Hey! Uh, I believe, hello, hello, Kabelvag. So you were over there mapping the whole time. Yeah, it's a village, um, (laughs) municipality in Nordland County, Norway, southern shore of an island in an archipelago up way at the top in the northern bit of Norway. Kabel... Vog? Cobble Vog. I don't know. Well, shout out I'm to probably surely b- butchering that, but shout out to Big Cobbs, you know? Yes, zip code is a better deal. Thank you for the zip code boost. Appreciate it. All right. Well, that brings us to the end. It's a little bit shorter this week, but we're still grateful for everybody who participates. We had 38 of you turn on those sats as you listen and just stream those sats, and you collectively stacked 88,097 sats for us this week. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. When you combine that with the boosters... We stacked a humble, but still not too bad, 304,771 sats. Thank you, everybody who participates in this. This, of course, is tremendously fun for us to hear from you, following up on these things, provoking like new conversations and new entire directions in the show. 54 total unique people between streams and boosts that are just out, you know, like that's, that's connection. That's so cool. It is really cool. And it's been an ad winter for a prolonged period of time. I don't think the show would be here without the support. In fact, I don't think, I know. Without our members and our boosters, the show wouldn't be here. And they're doing, you know, kind of better, the ad industry. Like, it seems like it's kind of turning around for some folks. But I am not 100% sure that they'll ever fully return to our niche. I think they've just kind of moved on. You got burned on the whole podcast thing. And oh, well, now there's more interesting markets. They got, and especially like the really technically niche ones. Uh, you know, and we didn't do this. We never had this problem. But a lot of podcasters overstated their numbers by about 30 percent and they got burned. And I don't I don't see a lot of advertisers coming back to this neighborhood of podcasting. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but I I really don't. And, and part of me, part of me hopes that means the value for value model will grow and expand because podcasting is so unique in that no one company owns the podcast platform it's all RSS feeds. There's hundreds of clients that compete in an ecosystem out there. And each podcast is kind of like its own bespoke business. There's not They're not following one particular model like you might on YouTube. So podcasting is very still kind of unique in that way. And I think the funding source, it's best when it's distributed and it's from the audience as well. So while it's very painful over the last couple of years not to have sponsors, especially with inflation going like crazy, I'm still kind of Still kind of excited about this transition we're making. Let's figure this out. Exactly. We've got to figure this out. And I think long term, it's for the best. So thank you, everybody who's a member of her boost in. If you would like to boost in and you haven't done it yet, we have links at the top of the show notes that make it really easy to get started. Or go to podcastapps.com and pick out one you like. There's probably a podcast app that fits your style and your tastes. So I got a, I got a, a bit of a pick blow. You up. stuffed the picks full this week. I did. I did. Because number one, I think, is a pick that people are, that are looking at Fedora should know about. And this is for maybe newer folks out there. It's Fedora Media Writer. It's a tool to create a live USB drive, a Fedora. And when you launch it, it makes it really easy to select what version you want. It downloads the ISO in the background, all that stuff, and it just starts automatically writing it to the disk. But what's really great is they also make this tool available for Mac and Windows. So for somebody who's getting their ISO for the first time, it's probably not something you think about a lot as a Linux user. It's actually kind of tricky for them to figure out, I got to go get a what, and then I got to do what to it, and how do I do that? And then get some other third-party tool to install it. And there's some good ones, but they're a little older, a little less user-friendly. Fedora Media Writer. Works on Linux, of course, but to have it on Mac OS and Windows, I think, is a big deal. And if you're trying out uh, any GNOME-based Linux, but in particular Fedora 41 Workstation, then you might want to take a look at my next pick, and that is GDM Settings, where you can customize your login screen, change aspects about its look, the background, stuff that Plasma kind of has built-in settings to do, but GNOME does not. It is only a Flatpak app, too, I believe. I think two of these picks on here are only distributed as Flatpaks. GDM settings might be one of them. So just install Silverblue already. What are you, what are you missing out on? <laughs> yeah. So if you wanted to tweak GDM or put your own background or change some of the, you know, settings, there you go. And then I got one last one for you. And as you heard me say earlier, I've been using a lot of web apps because I've been using ARM. And this next app is just called Web Apps. And as you might think from the name, it allows you to install websites as desktop apps. 
These come and go. Uh, this one is a more modern take on it. And so any app or any website you want, you can have it show up as an app with its own separate window. And um, it uses its own internal browser, isolated from the system browser. Just don't call them WAPs. Yeah, they're not WAPs. But this is nice. I played around. I had one that didn't work very well for me and I had a couple that worked just fine. So three apps for you. And if you're on ARM or something like that, to be able to take some of these websites that you frequently have to use in the web browser and just break them out into their own window with their own process is really nice. And that's what Web Apps does. So three, count them three, Fedora Media Writer, GDM Settings, and Web Apps, which I will have links for in the show notes. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm going to definitely keep Fedora 41 on my MacBook, but I suppose you boys... You're probably retooling for our episode next week because we're going a whole different direction next yeah, week. Yeah, we are. It's going to be fun, though. Do we give a little hint of what we're doing or do we just keep it a mystery? Well, if you're a Seuss lizard, you're probably going to want to listen up. But also, it, you know, we're going to address a longstanding issue that Brent has had on one of his laptops. And we're going to solve it live on the show next week. So it should be a lot of fun. There'll be a little bit something for everybody. And you still can boost in the distro that you have used the longest, how long you stuck with it. And if you're still using it. And we also are still soliciting your favorite versions of SUSE and OpenSUSE. So right now, I have one for 9.3, two for Tumbleweed, one for Aeon, one for Leap. And, and then we had, I think, one person might have been on – no, it was Leap. Yeah. So it's not – it's kind of spread. I guess Tumbleweed has two votes. It's the only one that has two votes right now. We're looking for the break away from the audience, and we'll explain why next week. You still have time to boost in your favorite version of SUSE and the distro you spent the most time with. And of course, you could always join us live. You know, we will be live next week, as we do every single week. See you next week. Same bad time, same bad station. Yep. We do it on a Sunday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. We're also live in your podcasting 2.0 app of choice, so we'll be penning in there. And when we go live, you can just tap and listen. And of course, jblive.tv will be lit up. And jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar has that time in your local zone. We usually get in that mumble room solid hour before we start recording or so so you can always show up in that mumble room too and listen in and participate links to what we talked about today well that's at linuxunplugged.com slash 587 you'll also find our mumble info matrix info rss feeds and all that thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the unplugged program i'll see you next i'll see you next sunday as in tuesday as in sunday <laughs>